Uh, it's great to be here this morning with everyone. Uh, even though I'm not with everyone, I am with everyone, uh, at least in spirit. And uh, so uh, this morning, I want to talk about two parables. Uh, and one, really one parable, but in order to do the first parable, we have to, or the second parable, we got to look a little bit at the first. Um, they can both stand alone and are both frequently used alone, uh, but usually they are told in succession, or they can be told in succession because they both follow each other. Um, again, both kingdom parables uh, and have great applications to our lives uh, today, um, especially as I hope you understand, uh, at least for me, uh, I am uh, in the kingdom of God. Um, someday I'll be uh, really closer to God uh, in his kingdom. Uh, but today in this life, uh, there is a spiritual path uh, that we can walk. And uh, that walk, uh, whether we might realize it or not for ourselves, is definitely uh, in his kingdom today. So this is uh, from a message that I gave way back uh, in June of 2013. So I, uh, I really have all of these uh, notes and things in, in little books, um, unfortunately not on my computer anymore, uh, which I wish I still did. Um, but it's, it's going to be talked about in a little different way uh, than back then uh, due to things that I've learned um, and that, that we've learned together. Um, so hopefully you won't remember this. Uh, but... I know Wednesday night, uh, I said that I was going to uh, do uh, a certain topic, um, but honestly, I I haven't devoted enough time to it to actually do anything on it. I, I thought I could this week do a little more, uh, but work has been uh, insanely busy um, and working really long hours uh, every day, and I just didn't have the time. So I apologize for that. If any, any of you were looking forward to hearing that, um, definitely will be something uh, I can do in the near future, hopefully. Um, so uh, we're going to start off with the first parable, uh, and it is going to be found in Matthew chapter 13 and verses 18 to 23. Uh, and of course, uh, you might recognize this as a passage um, that talks about a very popular parable, which is uh, the sower. Uh, the, the, the parable that is thought of probably the least amount um, out of these two is the weeds. Uh, mostly, uh, we frequently hear in Christian circles of all kinds about the sower. And uh, we break down who the different people, the groups of people that uh, the sower might be talking about. But to me today, the real purpose here is going to be um, talking about the sower uh, and what the sower has to do with the weeds, because the sower um, is one and the same person. Uh, and the sower really is, uh, really is, especially in this first parable, the sower uh, is the center of the story, uh, not what we usually think about as the different seeds that fall on different types of soil. Uh, but the sower, you have to, when we read this, uh, which we'll do after a word of prayer, um, we're going to read uh, not the parable itself, but we're going to read Jesus' explanation of the parable. Um, it has to be seen uh, from the mind or the, the viewpoint and the mindset of the sower. Uh, because when, when one sows seeds um, or does any type of gardening or as a farmer, uh, they have a certain viewpoint of the soil and the plants and what they want to see accomplished. Uh, and when things don't happen that way, we have the different types of folks or different types of the, the seeds that fall in different types of soil and different things happen. Uh, it's it's not desired and it doesn't make the sower happy uh it makes the sower unhappy 
because they want to use every, uh, they want each seed to reach its fullest potential. Um, for a farmer, that could mean their wages uh, for the year or for the season. Uh, and for someone who is a, a farmer or gardener at home, it could just mean, well, I spent money uh, on all these plants or seeds and, you know, I don't want to see it wasted. And of course, uh, if you have a, a, a home garden, you enjoy what comes out of it. Uh, you might even want to have enough where you could share it with neighbors or friends um, or something to can or make something of. Uh, you, if you can things, you want to have a good stockpile. Um, so you want everything, each seed or each plant um, to reach its fullest potential um, so that the benefits can be shared. Uh, so let's have a word of prayer and then we will uh, get right into it here. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for um, your word. Uh, thank you for your son uh, and the cross work. Um, I'm very thankful that uh, he, he chose to give of himself for us. Uh, I'm very thankful for um, the word that has been uh, sown in our hearts. Uh, and I, I pray that you would uh, let it go beyond our hearts and, and seep into our minds uh, each day as we, we walk in you uh, and walk in the newness of life that you have for us in your kingdom. Uh, and Lord, I pray that uh, for each of us, um, that you would be able to work in us uh, each day uh, so that we might do our part uh, through actions uh, or words uh, to, to make sure that uh, we are uh, ministers of reconciliation, as Paul talks about, um, because that is your goal, to conciliate uh, the world to yourself, and it is something that you are actively uh, doing on an individual basis. Uh, I pray that we could be part of that, um, and so that uh, we could be part of what you're doing, uh, and the, the success that you're having um, could also become ours. Amen. All right, so Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 to 23. Uh, throughout the morning, I will be reading from the NRSV. Um, I don't believe, without looking ahead, don't believe I'm coming from anywhere else. Uh, so if you have one of those, great. If you don't, uh, you can read along with what you have or just listen. Uh, I'm not going to give any time this morning to, to flip around, uh, simply because when you're doing this on a computer, it is so handy to have it all in front of you and I'm not flipping. Uh, so verse 18, here then the parable of the sower. Uh, and remember, the parable is of the sower. Uh, it, it's not the parable of the seeds or the parable of the soil or the parable of the situations of the soil or where the seeds are going to. It's the parable of the sower. Uh, so in verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is shown or sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has not uh, root but endures only for a little while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and its yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Uh, so that is Jesus explaining um, the parable to his disciples. Uh, you know, almost as if it needed explaining. Um, I suppose if Jesus had said the parable to me immediately and I uh, was coming from nowhere, I probably wouldn't understand either, but thankfully we have uh, a record so we can understand it. But the Jesus equates what he's talking to, um, to the word of the kingdom. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, to start off with, when he reads the parable, it's, it's not 
uh, immediately told as a kingdom parable, but uh, in the verses following the parable, he talks about the reason for parables, uh, which we spoke about recently on Wednesday night. And uh, in that, he mentions that it's about uh, the kingdom, if you want to go back up there and look. And then, of course, uh, right here, when he tells what it's about, he mentions the kingdom. Uh, so anyone uh, who is hearing uh, and doesn't understand can easily be pulled away. Uh, and he says this is what is sown on the path. So in all three of these, we want to imagine um, if we take it all the way back to 2013, we imagine, uh, we could imagine a sower walking on a, a beautiful, rich uh, soil, a field that has been tilled and it's been manured and composted. Uh, and it's just beautiful and rich soil. Uh, but that's not uh, necessarily the field that we have. Um, the field that we have has all different types of soil and stone uh, some places where the, the path has been worn so hard. Uh, if you've ever gone hiking uh, on a, a, a well-used hiking trail, uh, sometimes there's not even mulch or stone or anything down. It's just the ground has become so hard and compact for people walking on it so often uh, that nothing grows on it. Uh, in fact, um, if you have ever been hiking, even deer, uh, or other animals, you can you can pick out, um, <clears throat> if you're a seasoned hiker, you can pick out where there's little cross trails, and they seem small, but they're also hard-packed areas uh, from traffic from animals. Uh, so th this is the kind of, uh, some of the diversity of soil um, that this sower is, is planting on, or throwing, or casting his seed on, uh, because it's not... Um, it's not as if it's a farmer uh, who is purposefully, you know, using his thumb and you know, every few feet sticking a seed in the ground and then covering it up a little bit and then watering it. Uh, this is a person who has a basket in their arm or a bag in one arm and they're reaching in with one hand and they're just uh, flinging the, the seed about um, and hoping for it to take root somewhere. Uh, my mind always pictures Johnny Appleseed, a uh, little cartoon or character, caricatures of Johnny Appleseed throwing apple seeds all over the place, uh, hoping that uh, apple trees will grow. Um, but that's what that's what this is. Uh, the reason it's like that is because this sower is not just looking to sow on a uh, on a field that is ready for uh, receiving seed. This sower is hoping for uh, his seeds to take root wherever they can. Uh, and he's going to be hoping for, uh, we won't see it tonight, but there's other play or this morning, there's other places, uh, at least one other place in the New Testament where uh, in the gospels where he says the, the harvest is ready, who is going to go uh, and bring it in? So, hopefully those that are going to bring it in would find that there was a little seedling stuck on top of a stone uh, and they would take it and transplant it and care for it. Uh, and so that's what the hope is here, that these seeds would all find um, a place. But in reality, the sower knows it's not going to happen. Uh, and so there's uh, somewhat of a feeling of, um, a feeling of disappointment, I believe, on the sower's part, uh, that's, that some of these things aren't going to happen. When you think of the parable of the rich uh, young man, um, or it's not a parable, sorry, when you think of the story of the rich young man who uh, walks away upset uh, and dejected because he's done all these things that the law requires, but the one thing, uh, you know, one of the greatest commandments that he even recites he can't do it because to follow it completely involves giving up uh, of himself and giving up uh, all of his riches. Uh, and, you know, we don't read in that, but we have to imagine Jesus also having sorrow um, for that young man as he walks away. 
you know, and I, I think we can get that right from where uh, in Matthew, where he says, um, you know, when he's crying out to Jerusalem, uh, you know, the city that I have longed to care for, uh, like a mother hen cares for her chicks, uh, and they just weren't willing. Uh, and that was sorrowful for him. So I think each, not just as a, a city or as a uh, people um, of Israel, but each person individually uh, to Jesus brought uh, sorrow. Uh, and of course, that's that are, are some of the folks that he died for on the cross uh, for all. But um, for those, I'm sure that he had in mind um, as it was all happening and and coming down that he had sorrow for some of those folks. So let's get a better picture of the field. And for that, we can turn to 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians both, because um, Paul talks about uh, fields. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we read, For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field, God's building. So Paul is using two things. Um to equate uh, the folks of Corinth to. They're either, they could be a field or he's saying they could be a builder. And I'm imagining he said that because he's probably talking to people that are in agriculture and he's probably talking to people who are in uh, construction, we'll say, um, and others. But the knowledge would be in their heads to understand what he was talking about. And of course, in the previous verses, he's talking about him and Apollos and how some say they're following one, some say they're following the other. Uh, but they are God's field. So whether it was Paul planting or sowing the seed, which is what Paul was doing, uh, and then Apollos or others, uh, whether Timothy or Titus or other ones later on, would follow to the different areas uh, and come in and try to try to nurture those people along. It didn't matter because the seed came from God. And it was being sown in a field. And each of those different people uh, in Corinth, um, whether it was one group of people or it was probably uh, at least a few different groups within Corinth, there, all of those different people represent different seeds that fell on different types of soil. Uh, and so the idea is that the seed was sown uh, by Paul, but the seed is God's seed uh, being sown in uh, Apollos was one that was just helping to nurture the seed. Uh, but the uh, the main thing that I want to get to here is that um, they were God's field. Uh, and the reason I want to uh, talk about this with Paul is because I want to get away from the idea that the only intended place for this seed to fall was Israel. Uh Jesus might have been right there in Israel trying to gather those people in, and that's where his seed was being cast because that's where he was speaking uh, and ministering to. But we know that other folks uh, who weren't Jewish also uh, heard Jesus um, and accepted that seed, and it grew within them, uh, such as the centurion. Um, but it, it, the field is is everyone. Um, you know, if you think about it in the Old Testament, uh, Israel was was the people that God chose to work with, but it, it's not like there was this this mass of earth, uh, and there was this little tiny spot on the earth because Israel really is a little tiny spot on the earth. Uh, that that was it. The field, even back then, was all of the earth or all of where a, a person existed. Um, it's just that they happen to be the ones that would be, hopefully, uh, God would intend that they would be the ones going out and spreading seed. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, we know how that story goes. Uh, and it brings us to Jesus um, uh, landing here in the midst of Israel or at that time, the Roman Empire, but within the area and speaking to the folks uh, who were Jewish. 2 Corinthians 10, 13 to 15 says, We, however, will not boast beyond limits, 
but we'll keep within the field that God has assigned us to reach out even as far as you. For we were not overstepping our limits when we reached you. We were the first to come all the way to you with the good news of Christ. We do not boast beyond limits, that is, in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our sphere of action among you may be greatly enlarged. So the inhabitants, again, the, are the field, the whole world. So Paul was called out uh, directly by God to uh, minister to, um, I won't even say a certain type of people or group of people. He was ministered to uh, reach the Gentiles. Um, which Paul said that he eventually would specifically go to alone. Um, but they weren't just Gentiles of a certain area. I mean, he reached out to a very large uh, range. So if you take that little spot of Israel um, in the of the world in the Old Testament and you go into the New Testament and begin to expand that uh, to regions of what today are Europe, um, possibly some people believe all the way to Spain. Uh, there are others that believe Paul may have even reached uh, at least uh, the southern portions of uh, what is today England. Um, I'm not so sure about that, uh, but there are some that believe that Paul had some wide, or at least people that he spoke to, had wide reach into the Roman Empire. And so that would uh, mean that the known world, which at that time was the Roman Empire, uh, would have re received um, the gospel. Uh, you know, there are some even that believe some of the, uh, uh, I can't remember which apostle, but I've read somewhere that some believe that this apostle will reach even as far as India. So it, the idea is that they did get out and they did spread the word, or at least people who heard it. If you think of the Thessalonians who Paul praised for their faith um, and commitment towards God because what they were doing and what they were saying was reaching out um, across the region. So we could only spread uh, and, and it kept spreading um, beyond that. Uh, and thankfully today we could see that uh, in different, different forms and variations, it has spread around the world um, for the most part. So uh, pretty amazing what God has been able to do. Uh, to get that seed to the whole world um, through different people. Now, in the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, Paul, of course, is talking about uh, going out. Um, and his point is to say that I, I'm not going into other people's regions who are, are uh, sowing this faith, or sowing this message um, to try to boast uh, of myself uh, in their areas or try to steal their labor from them. Um, but rather his hope was that the faith of the people that he did speak to um, would spread. And, and he says in verse 15, that our sphere of action among you may be greatly enlarged. So Paul saw himself uh, as a person, uh, his, his group that traveled around, um, he, he saw himself as having a sphere of influence uh, basically, and he wanted that to spread and get larger, uh, and, and not just by himself moving around, but by the folks that he talked to moving it around. Uh, so he, he sought to make sure that more of that seed that fell, that the sower had spread, um, the ultimate sower being God, uh, you know, uh, just by way of an illustration, uh, you know, where I work, we sell uh, many different types of uh, produce. And some of the produce uh, is very popular with people that come from certain growers. Uh, and they see that name on the package and they get it because um, that package means that name means something to them. Um, I'm not going to divulge names, but, you know, if you, if you go and you get strawberries, uh, there's one really popular name. Uh, but what many people don't understand is that popular name started off as a farm. And they still are a farm uh, of their own. 
but the product now comes from all over the place, including South America and Mexico, because we, uh, as people around the world, have kind of gotten out of the idea of actual seasons um, and expect things all the time. Well, in order for that to happen, this farmer had to actually go to these other places of the world and employ other farmers. So they went out and found people that shared uh, their same passion for what they grew and quality and, and standards, uh, and, and they employ them. It's the same thing that God did. Uh, God was always seeking to have farmers underneath him that would go out and sow the seed. Uh, and Jesus, in the New Testament, really was truly the first uh, true dedicated farmer that was going to go out and sow the seed. Uh, and thankfully, along comes Paul, uh, who becomes another truly dedicated farmer that goes out and sow the seeds. That doesn't mean the disciples or other apostles didn't also. They did too. Uh, but it just seems that we read that Paul um, was maybe a little more dedicated to getting out to the world uh, to do that. But And then after him, more and more come along. Uh, and so that is the process that happens. Um, and we have to, if we, before we get to the second parable, let's think of a, a seed or a plant is planted and you want to nurture it. Um, and seeds, seeds get the ground different ways. There are some seeds that get when the, the plant, uh, the wind blows and you see the little seeds that are attached to the uh, little frilly cottony looking, uh, I don't even know how to describe them, but you know what I'm talking about. You see them floating through the air. I always reach up and try to grab them, <laughs> you know, and then once you do, you you take the little parachute or whatever was on it and it, it gets all mangled. And of course, then it doesn't go and it falls to the ground. Well, you know, you just, if you do that, you just help sow a seed. Uh, just a seed floating through the wind um, gets to the ground. And so different trees and different plants go like that. I always uh, call uh, one of our dogs, Kurt, sometimes I always call him Kurt the farmer because uh, sometimes we take him for walks and he gets those, um, he gets those sticky seeds all over him. And of course, you know, they clump. And so I stop him and we stop and he sits down and I pull him out of his fur and throw him to the ground where, of course, they uh, eventually germinate and grow so that they can stick to his fur again. Um, some plants hold their seed uh, and they grow and they die with their seed and they fall they, they fall to the ground and they end up being composted and um, without anybody doing anything, the seed germinates and again starts to grow. Uh, and some of these do this every year. We call them self-seeders. Some do it every other year. Uh, it, you know, the, you get these beautiful, like foxglove, you get this beautiful plant um, that's got really intricate, beautiful flowers. Uh, and if you don't know about it, it dies off and you're like, it didn't come back the next year and you're disappointed. But then a couple years later, it pops back up again because that's how they work. Uh, and so uh, it's amazing in nature. We have all these pictures um, of what God is doing right in front of us. Uh, it's just a, uh, it's just a really neat thing. You, you could see all these different things in nature and, and understand that they, they all show us uh, what God is doing today and what God has always been doing. Um, it, it gives you a really neat uh, picture of what's going on. So the second parable is the parable of the weeds. Um, in the uh, the vestibule of my workplace. We have a, a giant mural hanging over the entrance uh, and it's of a farm. And uh, there's this, in the middle of it is a, a huge pile of uh, perfectly placed by a photographer of beautiful vegetables of different kinds. Um, very eye appealing. Uh, and I have seen that mural for uh, every day for as, since they started using them uh, for decades, or at least a couple decades. And 
I never noticed until uh, a couple days ago, I was standing out there with my boss and we were talking about something, a project we we're going to do. Uh, and as she was talking, um, my mind, of course, my eyes are wandering around and I was looking at the soil that those uh, crops were sitting on top of. And, uh, you know, there's the edging along and there's grass is kind of moving into the edging. But I, I never noticed before that in the clumps of soil that these are sitting on top of are weeds, uh, grass, but there were little clumps of it spread around. Uh, I, I don't know why they included that in there. I'm guessing because it was just a photographer's eye to break up the dark color of the soil. Um, but it's interesting uh, because you think in your mind of a, a farmer's beautiful field. And when you're driving by at 15 miles an hour in your car, you see beautiful soil and rows of crops. Um, but if you go out onto that field, um, which I've had the privilege of doing because of my work. Uh, if you go out onto that field and walk, say, between rows of corn and you look down, it's not perfect soil. Uh, there are stones, uh, sometimes large stones. Um, there are uh, weeds all over the place. Uh, and so the farmer uh, becomes not concerned so much as for the weeds. Of course, many farmers today use uh, pesticides uh, uh, and herbicides to try to get rid of the weeds. Um, but you think of organic farming, uh, they don't do that. And, you know, you think maybe an organic farmer is someone who uh, is out on their hands and knees uh, picking weeds all the time to keep their, their crops healthy. However, uh, organic farming has now grown uh, to be on the, the same uh, footing as far as acreage as conventional farming that uses chemicals. Uh, it, they might use non-chemical sources to try to control weeds, but amazingly enough, they also are not super concerned with all of the weeds because they know once their plant is big and healthy, it will overpower the weeds and the weeds will stay small. Uh, even if they get big, it doesn't matter because they're going to get um, a good return on their investment on their crops. So they leave the weeds uh, and they don't worry about them uh, to some extent. Uh, not so if you're a flower gardener uh, like myself and my wife, Lisa, we have uh, a lot of flower beds. In those, we definitely don't want weeds. Um, we do have one uh, garden that grows along a creek that we have put in and it's all hostas, which get big and they have massive leaves. It needs a good weeding uh, in the spring. But once those hostas grow and start getting big, uh, you only see occasional weeds that actually grow over them. And a few times a year, you have to go out and pluck some of those out. Um, but if you were uh, to crouch down and um, get underneath some of those hostas, you'd see a lot of weeds. Uh, and they just never take off and, and grow like they should because they don't have any light because they're covered uh, by these other larger plants, uh, which is actually quite convenient, but it's the same type of idea. But in, in the spring, uh, when you're picking weeds, you have to be really careful uh, of what you're pulling. And so let's... Uh, Turn to Matthew, back to Matthew 13, if you had turned over to Corinthians. And we're going to read verses 24 to 30. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did all these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather him them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat among with, with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, 
And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in the bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So God's field is the world. And the sower, uh, we're going to see, or in my mind, uh, is the householder. Um, this is the same person who has sowed all of the seed, and it's growing. Uh, and of course, the crop here, uh, Jesus says, is um, wheat uh, or whatever type of similar grain they would have had in Jesus' day, and it's growing. Uh, but someone has come along and purposefully sown uh, um, what, if you follow uh, the Greek word, amounts to darnel, and darnel is something that looks like wheat, but it has a different kind of seed in it. Uh, it's not desirable whatsoever. Uh, it's got terrible flavor, it's bitter, and possibly even could be um, not very good for you if you ate too much. But this is what someone sowed on purpose um, to get in there. And so as we're reading this, let's, let's remember one thing. It's a kingdom parable. Uh, and the kingdom of God is within the people. Uh, it's within us. It was within them. Uh, you remember also Jesus told uh, uh, someone after uh, they, of course, uh, repeated the, 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 uh, the two greatest commandments, and he was talking about how he's obeyed his mother and father and done all these great things. And Jesus says, you are close. Uh, to the kingdom. It's very near. Uh, and I think by that, Jesus was not necessarily saying the kingdom is not within you, but you are beginning to grasp uh, what it's all about. Um, and so these are the seeds of wheat. I think that in this particular parable, uh, we can skip past uh, the first types of seeds that land on uh, a path or rocky ground um, or trampled or whatever have you, these seeds uh, that have been sown were sown on good, fertile soil. Uh, these are going to be people that understand and are at least close um, to what's going on, and they're growing. But someone else has come by and spread some seed purposefully to try to uh, ruin the seeds that are 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 growing well, which would be the wheat. Uh, and, and to me, um, with, with everything that you know, I've I've learned over the past couple of years, and things that we're learning uh, together, uh, the, the person sowing these seeds, uh, the individual that's sowing these seeds, and of course uh, here it's called the devil. Um, I believe that the seed that is being sown here, uh, these weeds, uh, are nothing other than uh, the sowing of the old covenant uh, style of thinking, uh, which is uh, bucking against um, the coming new covenant uh, that Jesus is trying to uh, get rooted into people um, as he's working closer and closer and closer to the cross, uh, because after the cross, uh, it starts off small and grows and grows and grows bigger. Um, and we see that that one system is leaving and the new system comes in, uh, thankfully. And this older system uh, is, is constantly being reseeded. Uh, Paul fought that. Um, Jesus fought that. Uh, others, I hope, uh, hopeful that Timothy and Titus and Philemon and then all these, these other other folks were fighting that, um, and it was it was a constant battle. Uh, and the reason it's a battle, and the reason Jesus uses this parable of the weeds, uh, again, him being the sower. Uh, as I was just stating, if you, if you have a, 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 I'll use my my garden I was talking about a moment ago. Um, it's a a hosta garden, a hosta. Uh, does grow flowers, but the, the main attraction to hostas are all the different uh, shades of greens, uh, variegated whites mixed into some of the leaves. Um, and even as I've learned now, after having this garden for several years, 
uh, that if you plant different types of hostas, uh, the bumblebees love the flowers and eventually you start to get hostas that look like variations of each other, uh, which makes it even more interesting. But when they're, when they're small, uh, you know, little nubs and there's weeds all around their, their clump and you're trying to pick them out, you want to be careful that as you pull uh, the weeds that you leave uh, the plant that you want in the soil. Um, even some other flowers that are a little more delicate as you're, you're pulling up these weeds, uh, you know, you get, uh, we get clumps of grass in there um, and it grows a stalk. It's not as big as wheat, but it has that wheat look and the, this, the roots just go everywhere. And as I pull it up or pick it up, uh, sometimes you end up pulling up all the flower that you want uh, to stay in the ground. Uh, and that's the idea that we have here because the roots are all intertwined. They all come from the same uh, soil. Uh, they're all in there and growing together. Uh, and so it, it, the reason being is because people all live among each other. Uh, the people of Jesus' time, the Jewish society, uh, one Jewish person might have decided to follow Jesus. Um, you know, the folks in, Cor or in Colossi Colossae decided to follow Jesus, uh, and there was a mixing uh, of them and the people who were the Gnostics or the people who were of some form of Ju Judaism who were trying to get in. And you had to be careful uh, as someone like Apollos, uh, who was watering and tending in Corinth, you had to be careful and you had to use some scruples when you were trying to pick and pull the weeds because you didn't want to uproot uh, the ones that were that were growing as well. Uh, and, and so it was more of a nurturing those plants so that they would grow healthy even among all of the weeds. And that's what Jesus is getting to here. Uh, it was very important that they didn't uproot everything together. Uh, you know, you have, uh, you might have someone back then who had thoughts of a, a, a Jesus utopia. Let me uproot all these people and take them and plant them and we'll start our own city where it's just going to be us. Uh, that would be defeatist because the idea is that you stay among the weeds. That way you might sow and spread your seed, which it eventually might grow in that area and then the weeds will be drowned out and who knows maybe even some of the weeds would eventually um, become uh, the proper uh, fruits that we were looking for uh, not only that um, but there's this all also this idea of judging uh, you know everybody's in different places and different levels uh, in their growth in christ and we don't want to be uh, ones that are judging um, that we would uproot uh, one person um, along with someone else that we were hoping to uh, discard out of our uh, belief system. Uh, and so, you know, there's just too many variations. Uh, and as I've said many times before, there's one central, and that's the cross. Uh, and there's many things that surround the cross uh, that we all believe in differently. Uh, but the cross is, is the central theme. Um, and we can't imagine uh, as human beings that we have so many of the answers and that we are so correct in everything um, that we could possibly start uh, making dividing lines uh, because all we do is, is cause problems in God's field. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the other part of that that comes to mind is uh, Jesus says that, uh, you know, God causes uh, the rain to fall on everybody, uh, not just the healthy. Um, again, if you picture that farm field that you're driving by and it's, uh, you know, they have those, sometimes they're impressive, but the massive sprinkler that's, you know, shooting a hundred feet or a hundred yards in all directions. And, you know, it's this big, pipe it's all on wheels and they can move it back and forth you know going back to what we were talking about weeds and plants again it's that water's hitting everything uh whether it's a weed or 
the the plants that they want to grow um it's irrigating all over and that is exactly uh what god intends is that uh everything would be would be watered and nourished nourished and that he will worry about what happens with the weeds we don't need to worry about it uh, the folks that jesus was talking to the disciples didn't need to worry about it they just needed to worry about getting the seed out uh, and nurturing the seeds that were there uh, Jesus would worry about the rest. Um, so there's an explanation here that's given of this parable down in verses 36 to 43. And we're going to read that. Uh, it says, then he left the crowds and went into the house and his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. Jesus answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. Of course, that's himself, right? Jesus is the son of man. Again, he is the sower uh, in both of these. In verse 38, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom, and the weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. Uh, so there is a system, which is the world. So Jesus specifically went into this system uh, of the old covenant world uh, to sow good seed and for this seed to come up. Uh, just like Paul said that he went to um, the world, uh, in different various systems. I mean, he was among the Greeks, but in the Roman Empire, Um but interestingly, Paul was never out against the Roman Empire. He was there to sow seeds uh, for God. Uh, and it seemed like the biggest thing that he had to battle was the bad seed of the Old Covenant. Um, he constantly had to fight that. So that was the system that was working to be uh, overcome and changed. Uh, so the purpose was the same of both of them. Uh, it wasn't that Paul was going out to a completely different system. Um, he was reaching people who might not be part of that system at all, but it seemed that wherever he went, that system always tried to come in behind him uh, and ruin the seed that he had just planted. Uh, so there was always that going on. Jesus was fighting off the devil, and it was more than just the devil who was defeated. Uh, it was those who were working for this other system, which uh, we could say were being used for the purpose uh, of the devil to try to defeat what Jesus was doing. Uh, and so both were, were uh, Jesus and Paul were fighting that same system. Uh, today, that system is long gone, um, but there are many other worldly systems uh, that fight to keep um, believers and would-be believers uh, away from Jesus um, and the spread uh, of the good seed in the kingdom. Uh, but Jesus' main point here is that in verse 43, the righteous, or those who uh, we could say today would be made righteous uh, through the cross, would shine um, like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. Uh, I believe that these particular folks uh, that he's speaking to indirectly here who are going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father uh, were people who literally um, we're going to be taken away and shine like um, the sun in the kingdom of their father. Uh, but we uh, here today, as we're still being born in this world, uh, we believe and uh, we are made righteous by the cross. And the hope is that we would shine forth uh, like the sun, as Paul says, like lights in the world, um, and that we would help to uh, overcome for others uh, and free them from the system that they're in, which is the world. So 
you know, if you if you remember back to when I did uh, something out of Eugene Peterson's book, uh, Reverse Thunder, uh, that's exactly what his point was in that book, um, was that you could take Babylon and the system and you could apply it all over the place. Uh, and our purpose is to be getting people um, to rise above that. So uh, this particular harvest has already taken place. Um, that's not to say that there are no more harvests, uh, because honestly, if you think about it, there are billions and billions and billions of new harvests every day, uh, because every day uh, new believers uh, spring up um, and eventually uh, in their human form uh, pass away and become a harvest um, to either one side or the other uh, harvested. And if they, they fall, as uh, these Pharisees do, onto the side of weeping and gnashing. Uh, and honestly, when I thought about this, I'm not sure that the anybody that is plucked up today that uh, uh, happens to be a weed is necessarily going to have weeping and gnashing. Because maybe they don't know the difference. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, when, when they're in their resurrected state, um, they, they get things that they learned in life that were supposed to be the way of things. Uh, and, and there's enough there um, that all that burns off and, and they're able to, to shortly uh, enter the kingdom. Um, and, you know, I believe that the Pharisees, how many might today be after 2000 some years uh, might be still outside the gate, still have a chance to get uh, in there um, because the, the gnashing we saw, quite a while ago, um, and I'm going to read one more passage here before we wrap it up, uh, Luke 13, 26. He says, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves are shut out. Uh, Jesus isn't talking about um, their wandering life on this earth. He's talking about their next life. Uh, you are going to be outside of the kingdom and outside of the kingdom, there will be gnashing of teeth. And I don't know if you remember some time ago, we did something about wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth. The gnashing uh, isn't because they're in pain. Um, the gnashing of teeth um, in the Greek and even in uh, the Hebrew, the idea behind it uh, for the Jewish person, even the person at that time was gnashing of anger. Uh and it's specifically a gnashing of jealousy because someone else has something that you thought should be yours and you are so angry with them uh, that you're gnashing your teeth. Uh, we probably do it uh, throughout our lives sometimes, right? Uh, sometimes we do it where nobody can see it and sometimes we do it where people can see it. Uh, and the teeth are gnashed together because we're angry about something and they're going to see their father's in the kingdom with the very prophets that Jesus said that their ancestors killed. Uh, and of course, they're going to kill Jesus, who was also a prophet. And when they see that, uh, it's going to really, it's really going to get them. Uh, and, you know, the idea is that hopefully, uh, you know, we read uh, later in Revelation that the gates are never shut. Um, those gates will always be open. I mean, it's easy to think of the kingdom as a, a beautiful place with uh, walls and all that, which is described. Uh, but honestly, it's a place um, without walls because it's there for everyone uh, forever uh, to enter into. Uh, and so the weeds will be taken care of and we do not need to worry about it. All we need to do uh, is nurture ourselves uh, and help nurture others, uh, whether it's through things that we say um, or things we do. Uh, and we can, I think, rightly today, um, picture our, ourselves um, as walking in the kingdom in a spiritual sense. Uh, and we could translate that into a physical sense just through the things that we do and the things that we say. Uh, and understanding that we want to be um, those that are uh, helping to spread the seed or allowing God to spread the seed through us probably is more correctly, uh, and then helping to nurture um, others. 
Uh, and that nurturing doesn't come through, uh, you know, deep theological discussions or anything like that. That nurturing comes just through uh, caring for each other um, in this world uh, and, and trying to help pull people out of the systems of this world um, so that we can be free together um, from all of it. Uh, and, and that we can try to reach those um, who would listen uh, and be heard um, and, and work with our, our great God uh, in what he's doing and, and picture ourselves walking his kingdom um, with the gates wide open uh, and, and getting out there and getting those that are outside uh, and have no idea uh, what it is to be inside and to be part of it uh, because it is uh, an exciting and awesome experience um, as I'm learning uh, for myself. Uh, and that is where I'm going to end it for this morning. So I hope that was uh, beneficial. I know it was something I did before and maybe you remember, maybe not. Um, again, I apologize for not talking about what I said I was going to talk about, um, but hopefully that will come in the future. Uh, and uh, thanks for listening.